following program is a SUTV student production. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Salisbury University, the University System of Maryland, its regents, administration, officers, employees, or representatives. On the broadcast tonight, parking. We'll take a look at how it will be even more difficult to park as new business moves into the area. Healthy eating. There are plenty of ways to eat smart and healthy in Salisbury, and tonight we'll tell you how. And lending a hand, Aaron Cahill brings us a story on how a group of people are doing their part to help those in need. This is SUTV Weekly News. Good evening. We begin tonight's broadcast with an issue that is of constant concern for students, parking. An already strained parking situation is becoming a little more difficult as a popular free off-campus parking lot will now be off-limits to non-customers. Taylor Rogers has that story for us tonight. Parking availability is about to become scarce for some Salisbury University students. Since the Superfresh store closed in the summer of 2011, this vacant parking lot has been a cost-effective way for students to park close to campus. But with Planet Fitness now moving into the College Square Plaza, the students will have to find somewhere else to park. I think it's silly if we can't park here. It's a public place. You, can, you should be able to park wherever you want. Parking passes are $90, I believe, and it's free here. So why would I pay to park when I can park here? Well, we've been parking here for years now because uh, parking is so expensive. So we get a, we take the walk and get free parking. I think it's ridiculous that Planet Fitness comes in and makes us park somewhere else. kind of hurts us as students. Prior to Planet Fitness's opening, University Police sent out an email to the campus community stating that any vehicles parked in the College Square Shopping Center would be towed as of November 4th and that parking permits are still available. The option is just buy a campus pass, which is, you know, like $100. Or, you know, I think a parking ticket's like 10 bucks over this if you get caught. I mean, it's either give or take, really, but I'll probably just end up buying a pass and spend an extra 100 bucks just because it's probably safer in the long run. I would probably find another side street to park on down the road or something or walk. Parking has always become a problem here for Salisbury University students, and hopefully by enforcing these restrictions, students will find other outlets provided from the university itself. Reporting from Outside Planet Fitness, this is Taylor Rogers for SUTV News. And less parking does not mean less accessibility to campus. Tonight, Jesse Snader takes a look at other options for getting around and how some of them might even be easier and more convenient than driving a car. Commuting to and from work has become an integral part of the average American's routine. Americans now spend more time commuting than they do taking vacation time. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, commuting alone has been the most popular way to commute in America for decades, despite the price of gasoline doubling since 2000. But that seems to be changing. High gasoline prices and more eco-conscious attitudes have Eastern Shore residents choosing different ways to travel. Robert Peterson is a frequent bike commuter. It's fast. It's, uh, it's easy to get around. Uh, you're not held to all the restrictions. You are legally, but not, no one enforces it. Um, I can get through campus quickly, and even if it's raining, you don't get too wet compared to walking. But there is downsides to biking. Avid biker Robert Peterson says safety is a good example. It's occasionally a little hairy on the smaller roads where there's no bike lane or, uh, or where the sidewalk is beat up so much you can't get on it. According to the CDC, 2% of motor vehicle crash fatalities in the U.S. in 2011 involved bicyclists. Cities are becoming more biker friendly by creating organizations that help bikers ride on roads without being endangered by cars. One local organization in Salisbury, Bike SBY, works with the local government to provide safe bike lanes. Bike SBY's website has downloadable maps to show where the marked bike lanes are and features biker-friendly businesses that offer discounts to customers who ride their bike. Yet another alternative commuting is the public transportation system. It's relatively cheap, reliable, relaxing, and is a good weatherproof option. Stephen Hohen is a community transportation coordinator at Shore Transit in Salisbury, and he says many factors are playing a part in increased ridership. And we we're finding out that as we try to make the system a more um, um, efficient and get to the areas where the people need to get on, um, that it, it's starting to meet the demands of a lot of people. 
And I think also because of gas prices have gone up, more and more people are, are using the system as well. One Salisbury rider has created his own method of alternative commuting. Ryan King is a proud owner of an electric golf cart, which he claims has benefits that other forms of commuting lack. I happen to be an environmentalist, and uh, this is electric powered 100%. So, advantage number one. Advantage number two is uh, it's convenient, and these seats are very plush and comfortable, and I can uh, pretty much park it anywhere on campus that I'd like to. So, foregoing a campus parking pass is uh, advantage number three for those of you keeping track at home. Although the golf cart may not be a feasible way to commute to work, you have to hand it to them for thinking out of the box. In Salisbury, I'm Jesse Snader reporting. And the University and the City of Salisbury have plenty of options for students to make healthy dietary decisions. Tonight, Tal Carmel tells us about some of those healthy eating options. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, or the USDA, farmers markets have grown dramatically in the last 10 years, doubling from 3,000 markets in 2000 to 6,000 in 2010. The influx of farmers markets like this one near Salisbury University has a positive impact on both the local community and the college students' dietary choices. We've got a diverse mix of products here and we get a good diverse mix of the population here. Um, more students all the time. We've always had uh, SU faculty have always supported this market. Jay Martin, the founder of this Camden Avenue farmers market, says the market didn't start out as a public market. People were driving by and, and wondering what was going on and would stop in and ask us if we had any extra vegetables, which we didn't at the time. Um, but soon thereafter, we started growing more and um, we brought some vegetables in to sell to the public. Martin is not the only member of the market to notice the change in clientele. Miss Eileen sells dairy products at the market. She says she's happy to see the younger crowd stopping by for groceries. I am very impressed that I have so many college, mainly males, but I have a few girls, that are buying eggs and are telling how they're so happy to be eating nutritionally healthy. Student Chip Conto says offering healthy choices is one thing, but educating students on how best to choose is probably more important. Yeah, I love comments. I mean, like, it's got everything you need in here. You got your veggies, it's got a full salad bar. You have all these options, but if students don't know what to eat, then it really doesn't help at all. Dietitian Kate Cerulli agrees, but says university eating shouldn't be about eliminating all foods that might be bad for you. For her, it is more about offering both so that people can treat themselves sometimes, but in moderation. We have soda, we have juice, we have soy milk, we have dairy milk, you know. Uh, so I think as long as foods that they're familiar with, you know, are still available, that, you know, why wouldn't you want, you know, more options, more choices? For a healthy diet, the USDA recommends two to three servings a day of fruits and vegetables for adults. In Salisbury, I'm Tal Carmel reporting. <laughs> and when we come back, we'll take a look at the weather with Dr. Darren Parnell. Looking for these? You drive buzzed, it could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Now let's take a look at what you can expect in the coming days from the weather. Thanks, Eli. Hello, Salisbury University and surrounding community. I'm Dr. Darren Parnell with your local area forecast. Well, it was a great day across the region this afternoon. Temperatures reached the upper 60s with partly cloudy skies and a light east wind. The high temperature this afternoon was about 10 degrees above average for the day. You certainly can't ask much more than that for this time of year. If we take a look at temperatures across the region, you can see that most areas reached at least the upper 60s with a few select regions across the bay reaching temperatures around 70 degrees. What was the reason for such the high temperatures this time of year? Well, this was due to a high pressure system that is sitting up over our area, creating very light winds and clear skies. And you notice if you look off to the west, we have a cold front that will be moving through our area overnight tonight into tomorrow afternoon, bringing us a chance of rain. If you take a look at, on the radar loop, you can see the rainfall that's associated with a cold front that is heading our way. 
there's not much moisture associated with a cold front, so you can expect very light rainfall totals uh, from the frontal passage that's gonna come our way tomorrow. And the rain should be out of here by early afternoon tomorrow. If we look at the forecasted surface map, you will notice a distinct wind shift tomorrow afternoon as the front is gonna pass over the, over the region. We will have winds out of the south in the morning bringing us very warm temperatures and those winds will switch to the northwest throughout the afternoon as the cold front passes over the area. The good news is high pressure will return on Friday and remain throughout the weekend giving us nice seasonal temperatures for the weekend. Another weak front, cold front will be crossing our area on Tuesday that will increase cloud cover and that will bring the next chance of rain will be on Wednesday as that cold front crosses over our area. So for tonight, what can you expect? You can expect very warm, unseasonably warm conditions overnight with increased cloud cover and the chance of rain starting shortly after midnight. The low temperature will be around 55 degrees due to the high humidity. The rain chances will continue through the early afternoon on Thursday, but expect rainfall totals to be light and rainfall totals overall will be less than one tenth of an inch. With a high temperature of 69 degrees, winds will be out of the south and be coming northwest throughout the day, again, as that cold front passes over the area. Starting tomorrow afternoon, skies will start to clear out, producing clear and chilly conditions, and that will produce an overnight low temperature around 38 degrees. Now looking at our seven-day forecast, you can probably tell we're losing daylight very fast this time of year. We're losing about two minutes of sunlight each day, and it's hard to believe that we're only 44 days away from the first day of winter. Temperatures will be above average tomorrow before the cold front passes throughout the afternoon. Winds will start off from the south, bring us warm temperatures, and then switch to the northwest throughout the afternoon. We will then have more seasonable temperatures through Monday with light and variable winds. As we're influenced by a high pressure system, skies will be clear, and this will allow the temperatures to really cool down after sunset. Expect a kickoff temperature around 54 degrees at, at noon on Saturday for the home football game against Ithaca. Cloud cover and a chance of rain will return on Tuesday into Wednesday as another cold front crosses the region. There is roughly a 30% chance of rain on Wednesday. That's all for this week's weather. Now back to you, Eli. Thanks, Dr. Parnell. And today, some students took advantage of this great weather by participating in a hot pepper eating contest. Jesse Esposito participated in and covered that story for us tonight. I'm here with Salisbury University's Garden Club, Will Barron, the president, who is putting on this hot pepper eating contest. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Yeah, actually we started it uh, last year. Um, this is the second one. Um, it's all the peppers that we grow in our garden. So it's all grown here on, on SU's campus. And we just harvest them all and we thought it would be a good way to, to you know, get our club name out there. Um, some really hot peppers this year. So I think they'll go through uh, 10 different rounds. So. so I'm here with Garrett Black. What is your role for today? Uh, today I'll just be helping out, uh, handing out peppers and stuff, reading the rules, making sure everyone's following. So we have Louisa Lamb here who did it last year. Louisa, what was your experience last year? Well, um, I ate peppers. I think I made it through 22 rounds. We just finished the hot pepper here eating comes contest. My core to come back. We had a lot of peppers thanks to Garden Club and supporters. Um, do you guys have anything to say? I think it was great. I'm glad everybody came out and participated. I just want to thank everybody that, that came out. One, one, of the, one of the winners, and I'm in pain. Um, this has been Jesse Esposito reporting for SGTV. Back to you, Eli. And if you're looking for something to do that won't hurt your taste buds as much, next week WXSU will be hosting Rave to Save. The event organizer talked to us about that tonight. The event is called Rave to Save, and it's basically the university's radio station, uh, WXSU's attempt to not only bring together the campus community, but in a uh, fun-filled manner that also uh, showcases the various talents of the uh, Salisbury community. So uh, we'll be featuring uh, student artwork there, uh, lots of blacklight type of artwork, um, you know, as you know, Rave to Save. Black lights, colorful lights, like it's a great time. Uh, we've got a lot of things set up right now and um, we're also gonna have a station at the event where kids can just come and make their own black light artwork. So uh, I think it's gonna be really neat. A lot of the other activities we'll be doing is uh, done by other clubs, so everything's kind of in-house, which has made this event more so than other events, like really kind of a collaborative community effort. So uh, we're really excited to see it happen. It's gonna be uh, the 12th of November, which is a uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday actually. We just want like you know everyone to have a good time, and you know, one is that that the university just gives you you know a bunch of funds to go throw a rave on campus. 
Really, like, I, honestly, I think it's unheard of. I've, I've never heard of that. So, you know, it's going to be a fun time. Now, the money from this event will go towards WXSU's Relay for Life team. Again, the event will be on this upcoming Tuesday from 8 to 11 in the Wacomico Room of GUC. And with some more campus events taking place this and next week, Jenna Payne gives us a look at what's coming up in SOAP. Uh, for the events that we have this week for SOAP, they're going to be really exciting, so I hope everyone comes out to them. Um, on Wednesday at 9 p.m. in Devil Bus 123, we're showing We're the Millers. It's a new movie out, and apparently it's really funny, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it. We're playing it a second time on Friday in Devil Bus 123 at 9, and then we're also playing it on Sunday at 1 p.m. in Devil Bus 123. On Thursday, we have an open mic night in Fireside Lounge. It's at 7 p.m., so if you have an instrument you like to play, a poem you want to say, anything like that, a song you want to sing, come out to Fireside and show off your talent. And then next Tuesday, we have a last lecture series. Um, Noel Habashi is a professor here, and he's going to be speaking about studying abroad, and that's going to be in the My Comica Room at 7 p.m., so if you're interested in studying abroad, come out to that. And there's also food. So even if you're not interested, everyone can have a fun time. So I hope you all come out to our events this week. Thanks. And the Gall Card is a lifeline for many students. It's a key to your room, a way to pay for merchandise, and rent out books in the library. Well, you can also use the Gall Card to buy food on and off campus. Tonight, Miranda Haney tells us about some of those off-campus vendors. SU students have one thing in common, their gall cards. With 49 off-campus merchants, it would be hard for SU students not to have an opinion about their gall card money. How easy is it to use your gall card off-campus? I think it's pretty easy. I know a couple of places that take it, like McDonald's and CVS, so those are at least easy places to use it. I personally don't think it's easy at all. I've only ever done it to uh, go to the health services. So The gold card is pretty easy to use. I use it all the time. And are you more likely to visit a business if it's gold card accessible? Yes. Matter of fact, Jersey Mike's, if they had a gold card, I'd be there every day supporting my home state. But since they don't, I never go there. SUTV caught up with Cody Kryman, a manager at Seagull Square's Breakfast Bum, to find out how gold cards affect business. People using our credit cards for cash, it always helps out. I mean, another way of receiving business is the gold card. So it just brings in more business than we normally would have. To learn more about how to use your Gull Card money, visit www.gullcard.salisbury.edu. From SUTV News, I'm Miranda Haney. And we'll have an update on SU Sports when we get back from this brief break. Sir, you're right. This isn't happening. He'll be fine. Yeah, I feel good. Really? No, not really. Buzz driving. Maybe we should stop acting like it's no good deal. Now, Cat Murphy gives us a look at SU Sports. The number 23 Salisbury University football team took its first Empire 8 athletic conference loss of the season falling on Saturday at Alfred University, 31-21. to Touchdowns by Joey Jones, Jerome Johnson, and Isaiah Taylor put the goals on the board, but it wasn't enough to secure the win. Johnson finished with a team-best 55 yards rushing, while Jones was 4 of 12 passing for 86 yards. The Seagulls will look to rebound at home next Saturday, November 9th, when they host Ithaca College. And in the final regular season match of the season, the number 10 Salisbury University men's soccer team 
blanked Wesley College 3-0 to remain undefeated in the Capital Athletic Conference play. With the victory, the men sit atop the conference as the regular season champions. Jake Perry, Stephen Poorman, and Benjamin Arietti secured goals for the Gulls, who entered the postseason as the top seed. SU has earned home field advantage for the semifinal game tonight, and the opponent is still to be announced. And the women's soccer team advances to the CAC semifinals following a 1-1 to -one draw and advance in the CAC playoffs 4-3 on penalty kicks. Sophomore Samantha Beck netted the only Seagull goal of the contest, allowing the four-seeded Seagulls to push the game to penalty kicks. Salisbury outshot the Bobcats 4-3 in the first overtime period and will take on Christopher Newport tonight. The number eight Salisbury University field hockey team closed out the regular season with a 3-2 overtime victory at Wesley College last Wednesday night. Junior Mallory Elliott figured in all three Salisbury goals, including scoring the game winner just over a minute and a half into the extra session. Salisbury will be the second seeded team in next week's CAC tournament. They will be up against the University of Mary Washington tonight. That's all for SU Sports. This is Kat Murphy for SUTV News. Yesterday was election day for many states around the country. Virginia elected Terry McAuliffe as their new governor, New Jersey re-elected Governor Chris Christie, and New York elected Bill de Blasio, becoming the city's first Democratic mayor since 1989. It was also passed in Illinois that gay marriage is legal. But for more on what's going on around this area and this campus, Jamie Potter gives us a look at what's in this week's edition of The Flyer. This is Jamie Potter with this week's edition of This Week in the Flyer. On the front page of this week's edition, a large photo is displayed of college kids having a blast in the college section of the annual Pumpkin Chunkin'. Some students had a great time, but as Peter Hicks reports on page four, others did not. In his article titled, Police Too Quick to Anger at Pumpkin Chunkin', he writes about an incident where he believes an officer jumped to conclusions and used unnecessary force. In his article, you'll read about a rough ending to a nice day for one student and how it could have been avoided. Another article taking over the front page is Jacob Troxell's piece titled, Mold in Campus Housing, a Recurring Issue at SU. He quotes several students telling the flyer where they have found mold, how it has affected them, and how they have received no immediate response to help or clean the mold. Duggan tells readers of the different opinions students have regarding advertising on social networks. In her article titled, Instagram Follow Follows Trend Begins Advertising. And Ashley Chafin writes about how the sophomore year experience has not been the huge success it was hoped to be in her article titled, SYE Gains Limited Momentum. And in the editorial section, Stephen Sename writes about the latest musical plagiarism lawsuit in his article titled, Marvin Gaye vs. Robin Thicke. He argues that in order to be considered copying, songs can't merely sound similar. There have to be significant matches. That's all for this week's edition of This Week in the Flyer. Now to Eli. Through economic slumps and times of growth and prosperity, there are always those that face hard times that could use a helping hand. Tonight, Aaron Cahill tells us about how one local shelter is offering that hand to those in need and how those receiving the help aren't the sole beneficiaries of what goes on at that shelter. Halo Center for Hope is located on Tillman Road in Salisbury, Maryland. Established in 2004, they say serving food and providing shelter with the love of Jesus is important. The impact of religion, I think that it's important that as an organization, you know, it's hope and life outreach. We love them like Jesus is the slogan. Um, it's important for us to maintain the religious aspect for the guests because a lot of times they don't know any other hope and we try to give them the hope of Jesus that everyone else has found, that we have found just as being Christians and this being a Christian running organization. Halo has served almost 300,000 meals to people around the Salisbury community. They are open 365 days a year with an open door policy. Not only do they provide food, but they also provide shelter for women and children with programs to help them grow. And I feel like this is a nice place. They just good sponsoring, good food, good help. You know, and God is good, and every, the ministries has helped me, and I continue want them to continue to help me. Halo is not government funded. Their funding for food and shelter comes from donations or their bargain center. Halo also has a bargain center, and so the bargain center is on Snow Hill Road, and that's where people can drop off any of their 
leftover things that they want to get rid of and then they sell it in their bargain center and that money comes back through Halo. We do a lot of purchasing of some of the food, so things that are staples that we always need to be able to put on what we put on here like bread, eggs, milk, those things. Um, we'll use the money for that, but a lot of it is donations. Here at the Halo Center for Hope, they have their own fish farm where they raise tilapia over a series of months. They use this and their food pantry, as you can see behind me, to help feed their guests. Halo's fish farm breeds tilapia until they are harvestable. Then, they fry the tilapia to feed their guests. Between this, their donations, and their volunteers, Halo continues to thrive. One student talked to us about how volunteering changed him. Yeah, I'm going to take things a little less for granted. I'm going to be able to appreciate the little things a little bit more. Because if they can do it, then I should definitely try it. Halo has affected the lives of many people around the Salisbury community. You can do your part by donating goods or volunteering at the homeless shelter. This is Aaron Kale reporting for SUTV News. For this week's edition of SUTV Weekly News, for all of us at SUTV, thank you for joining us and good night.